Hello and welcome to Bloomberg Quint. You're watching the fine print. Doing away with double taxation and the cascading effects of taxes, nudging the unorganized sector into the organized sector, reducing revenue leakage for the government and ensuring tax compliance by the entire supply chain. The input tax credit provisions of the goods and services tax regime are designed to achieve all these objectives and more. Will they? Won't they? And how should businesses ensure they get their due credit? To answer all of this i have with me santosh dalvi partner at kpmg india santosh welcome to the show uh, help me understand uh, let's start with the basics how will this input tax credit provisions be more pro uh, useful for businesses going forward compared to the current regime indeed as per the current regime not all the expenses incurred by the business are available as credit for the businesses uh, because of multiple taxation and of course the different governments are uh, involved in this but as far as GST is concerned all the valid business expenses incurred by the business would be allowed as input tax credit. So, so give me an example what is currently not available and tomorrow will be? Yes for example uh, today there are many uh, you know expenses for example uh, printing and stationery if you uh, spend on printing and stationery you don't get the credit of that for discharging VAT liability in various states except Maharashtra is the only government which allows those credit but uh, you know the tax credit which is given in the current regime is only for the inventory which is bought and sold or the inputs which are used in manufacture but over and above that whatever expenses you have incurred you don't get the credit and okay. that's the fundamental uh, change uh, from the current sure. regime. I th uh, so not only the universe of uh, transactions or goods or services gets expanded for which you will get credit I think the setting off mechanism also or the using of credits also becomes easier right because currently the credit that I accumulated by paying tax for instance in service tax may I may not have been able to set it off against or use it against to the my VAT uh, liability will that also become simpler yes uh, if I have to give you example of the retail industry currently the major cost which is incurred by the retail industry is the service tax on the property rental that is not available the credit because uh, the service tax on rental goes to the central government right. whereas the VAT goes to the state government but in GST on rental also there will be GST payable and which would be available to your retail businesses for claiming the offset against their GST liability. So that would actually help retail industry to bring down their cost of uh, you know overheads etc. Sure, we so that's how that. it would help. Okay. okay, but there is also an onerous, if I can use the word, requirement of producing certain documents to claim this credit, right? And if I can name it for the benefit of, of our viewers is, you will have to produce the tax invoice of purchase or debit note issued by the registered dealer. You should have actually received those goods and services. Tax on such goods and services had to ha has should already be paid to the government and you will need to file your returns for that. Do you think that this is an easy uh, to-do list to, uh, to avail the input? tax credits of course and this is the you know paradigm shift from the way the credit is available in the current regime in the GST regime right. uh, the responsibility is quite onerous and uh, it's quite process driven and uh, you know it's purely based on the, uh, the how the compliances will happen in GST regime the first and foremost uh, the difference between the current regime and the GST regime is that uh, today in the current regime the credit is totally controlled and managed by the businesses based on the receipt of the invoice from the vendor be it supplier or the you know uh, seller of the uh, inputs uh, they can take the credit manually because it doesn't have to go to government website or government portal but in GST each and every transaction of your purchase would be uploaded by your vendor okay and that would get auto populated in uh, uh, you know businesses as, as purchases okay and that has to be matched okay so on the GST portal by the uh, customer that is first second one has to also ensure that these goods or services have been received third is you have to make the payment to your vendor within 180 days so six months I'll come to that. The, the and point also that vendor has to make the payment to government right. if government has not received this payment from the vendor then there is an interest liability on your account as well as you have to reverse or pay back the credit which you already taken. Okay, sure. I wanted to uh, check with this. Uh, this in the steps of uh, of you know this this G GSTR returns. Uh, 
first I take the credit, right? And the reconciliation happens later. Yes. Which is the case even today that I take the credit and I'll have to produce the documents for that uh, at a later date. No, what is the difference in, then? In current regime, what happens, especially in VAT or even in SINVAT also, during the assessment stage, you know, this proof of uh, tax credit as well as vendor's payment, etc. match. So, there is a time lag of two to three years or earliest is the audit, you know, whenever department or government people come for the audit, that is the time they check for the credit, uh, you know, eligibility in terms of whether payment has been made by the vendor or not. But in GST, that would happen on real time basis. There is a time period of two months within which the government will come to know whether the vendor has made the payment or not. So that reconciliation timeline has reduced, which yes. means that if I have availed excess credit uh, or if I have availed credit but my vendor has not uh, paid paid the taxes, or oh, rather I can't avail the credit unless my vendor has paid the taxes, but there is a discrepancy in between what I have yes. uh, my return say and what my vendor's return says. The time lag for that reconciliation is now two months, which was earlier in the earlier cases could have been a year or two whenever the assessment comes up. I would not say excess credit, even if you take the genuine credit, which the payment you are supposed to make to vendor, but that you will take it uh, you know, in the first place, the moment the vendor uploads it on the GST portal, even if you the um, amount of credit which you take is correct, then if the vendor does not make the payment to government within two months time, then it's a penalty for the, uh, for the you know, customer or right. the purchaser. Right. Even if the amount of the tax credit which has been taken by the business is correct. So, it need right. not be excess credit all the time, right. but genuine and valid credit. Right. Also, if the vendor does not make the payment, it gets challenged and it has to be reversed and the customer will have to pay the interest also on that. Right. So, it is not only loss of the credit which is right. valid and due to the business, but also, you know, uh, un avoidable interest payment. Okay. So, because okay. Uh, if I can just pick up from this interest payment point that you mentioned, currently, uh, uh, currently how it works is that you do have to reverse that credit in what three months but uh, you don't reverse that credit with interest but here an interest component will also be applicable but the time period has become from three months to six months of reversal yes okay um, what sort of challenges do you envisage uh, because if my vendor doesn't pay that tax or he doesn't upload the invoices of goods he's sold to me um, do you understand uh, do you uh, imagine that in, in a in terms of the market dynamics those uh, suppliers will lose business I agree and it's not about vendor makes the payment I mean that that is also one of the important criteria but also if vendor does not upload in time see if I have made the purchase from the vendor in this month so, by 10th of the following month, my vendor has to upload it on the GST portal. So, A, if he doesn't do it on the due date. B, if he doesn't do correctly. What if he uploads the wrong amount? Okay. In what that is the process? What will I see, for okay, instance, okay, uh, okay. if, that, if yeah. this discrepancy happens? In that case, for example, uh, you are my vendor and right. uh, you have raised the invoice of 100 rupees to me. You upload it on 10th, okay? But then you wrongly upload it as 1000 or 10 rupees okay okay instead of 100 then i have two options i will tell you please correct it to 100 which is physically picking up the phone and telling yes, the vendor okay? yes in that case you happen to do that right. then i have to accept it right. okay so second option is that i will change it to 100 then it goes back to you and you have to accept that if okay. you don't accept then i don't get the credit okay so okay. it's a matching process that is what is very important and you know onerous uh, and time consuming process okay in case of mismatches of course if everything first is smooth, place yeah, yeah I mean everything is, is done okay let's yeah. come to some of the specific instances that might throw up challenges or which you know might not be clear to businesses how will credit or uh, availment of credit work for advanced payments i mean uh, these uh, these payments are fairly uh, natural in the course of business uh, but you know the requirement is that i should actually receive those goods and services uh, would it throw up some working capital issues to your mind Obviously, if you compare with the current regime, uh, in service tax law also the provision is there on in case of advance received, the service tax has to be paid, but the customer can claim the instant credit. Today. Okay, today. Right. But in GST, the condition is that on advance GST would be payable, but unless you receive those goods or services involved against that advance, you will not get the credit. 
so if there is a time lag of you know two months three months between the payment of advance and the actual supply obviously that would involve additional cash flow requirement for the purchaser right because you are not going to get the credit sure okay. okay so this is the case of advance payment where you know i've already paid the money what happens in cases where i'm taking uh, the delivery of goods in installments for instance or it's a long term service contract yes. of you know spanning over 5 months 6 months uh, again how will credit work in those scenarios uh, ideally in this case also the business process has to change otherwise what will happen if against one invoice say the goods are dispatched in say multiple consignments say four consignments and those four consignments get spanned over a period of say two months then i will get the credit only when the last consignment is received okay though i have received the invoice but since i have not received that uh, uh, you know uh, the supply i will not get the credit is there a way around it can you raise like for so tell me you in that case that's yeah. what i said as a business process then you have to bring in that change in your process of procurement hmm. you will have to uh, you know ask your supply to raise individual invoice against each consignment okay but but in and in many cases it may not be possible wherever possible certainly one should explore this why not uh, you know it it there may be assembling kind of uh, Uh, you know, if 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 the invoice can be easily split into multiple mm. uh, consignment independent, then certainly it can be done. Right. But it depends depends upon the product uh, involved in that. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. There's another change when it comes to uh, capital goods from the current regime to what the GST regime will yes. be, right? Because mm. the Senvat rules don't require you or allow you to. a portion credit today on capital goods but tomorrow if using those capital goods you're ma- making gst uh, tax applicable supplies and zero rated or exempt supplies you will have to apportion the credit again how will this work and any challenges this might throw up certainly it has to be apportioned between the taxable and exempt and in case a particular capital asset give me an example say for uh, yeah if the particular capital asset has been used exclusively for the exempt supply right. say i've got two products one is on which i have to pay gst and other one is uh, exempt say uh, in that case if the capital goods is exclusively used for uh, this purpose uh, the exempt then i don't get the credit i will have to lose the credit of that which means my cost of capital goes up in that case of course uh, uh, i can claim the in- depreciation under income tax so okay. one of the important criteria for uh, input tax credit in gst is that uh, on capital goods if you claim the gst credit in that in that case you can't claim the income tax benefit depreciation so either you claim the in- income tax depreciation or you can claim the input tax credit is it is that an easy choice to make uh, in terms of what will be more useful for business i would say gst credit would be easy because you get instant okay. whereas depreciation claim over you can over a period of, of time right. okay so that that's the choice okay. so in case of exempt uh, uh, supply where you use the capital goods for exempt supply you will not get the credit in that case you have no option but to claim it over a period, period by way of depreciation, depreciation. Okay. okay um also there is this uh, composition scheme right with for businesses which have turnover 75 lakhs or below um i may imagine uh, that you know i'm a composite supplier and i work you know with that rhythm you know file only the returns that i'm required to but over the course of the year my turnover exceeds 75 lakhs again how will the credit mechanism work in those cases good question so in case uh, you are below threshold limit of say 75 lakhs and you are about 20 lakhs then you can opt for composition scheme it's right. a choice of course sure. it's not a compulsion in it that case it just makes compliance easier yes in that case uh, but what happens is that as a business when you don't get the credit of inputs or capital goods so that right. at the same time what you have to pay is just 1% uh, uh, gst on your supplies or your turnover okay and that too you can't recover it from the customers but during the year if you have uh, any capital items on which if you have uh, you know you are under the composition scheme and if you exceed that then maybe in next year you will have to claim the credit okay in that year you will not get the uh, credit okay, okay so yeah. but yeah. i have to then let go of that credit yes, for the year yes, and maybe yes, start yes. afresh from the new financial yes, year yes, yes. okay all right santosh thank you for you know taking us through some of these questions uh, you've been you know working closely with a lot of clients uh, while i've you know uh, asked you these specifics any specific areas within the input tax credit provisions that is uh, be, uh, proving to be challenging for businesses see i mean as i said uh, 
certainly the the gamut of input tax credit has got widened okay but at the same time there is one irritant i would say which is that not all the you know expenses you pay will you will get the credit there are certain restrictions which are there even under the current regime also i can understand if it is motor vehicle you don't get the credit unless you are a dealer in motor vehicles then only you get the credit but uh, credit of works contract tax paid which goes into immovable property which means if you are making your office okay in that case whatever tax you pay to your contractor you will not get the credit it should mm. be available as a capital goods i would say because right. it's a capex cost second um, the biggest irritant is you know uh, expenses of personal nature mm. so how do you actually you know define expenses of personal nature in the current regime also similar provision is there and that has led to lot of litigations okay. and i would say in gst also because of this particular uh, Uh, so the credit is not available if you are using the goods or supplies for personal And how do you use? define that for example if if you are on office duty business duty and you end up uh, uh, you know eating in hotel is it for personal consumption but of course you have used it while you were on duty so why you know club membership you know mm. mandap keeper charges all those uh, even insurance also mm. all those expenses should be allowed guest house uh, or canteen expenses Mm. now the law provides that canteen if it or certain benefits which are given to employees which are as per the statutory requirement then only you will get it mm. but in in today's regime you know lot of employee welfare benefits are given by the employees because of you know they see the productivity also can be improved but in that case uh, it would be considered as expenses of personal nature just because those individual sure. you know so i i think that that, that is the biggest irritant i would say and also the area where the litigation can arise because of that okay sure santosh uh, before i let you go and this is about the input tax credit provisions but we do have questions that uh, that viewers of our last show wrote to us and this is not got to do exactly with input tax credit provisions but while i'm here i might as well put it to you yeah. uh, you know chirag ashor asked us are hsn codes or sac compulsory for every invoice of gst and i suspect the answer to that would be yes 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 initially government will go uh not be not be very strict but over a period of time they will insist on hsn codes okay yeah. he also wants to know santosh for a retailer who is selling goods on the mrp inclusive of all taxes yes. will the gst be charged separately no see there are two things w- one is gst that is of course uh, a tax law but uh, there is one act called legal metrology act hmm. that act is the aim of that act to ensure the consumer protection so that the end price which is called as mrp printed on that product you know no seller can recover even a single rupee more than that okay right. so that mrp is the final and that is supposed to be inclusive of all the taxes now going forward in gst also the mrp has to include the gst element in that so if you go to retail and buy a say box of pencil if that mrp is printed in that case the gst should have been included in that he can charge any gst over and above the mrp price okay but then how as a consumer do i know tomorrow that uh, the benefit of you know lower taxes that the gst council has going has been going to town with how do i actually know that i'm getting that benefit you don't have to worry government has done its job by coming out so with I anti profiteering so i uh, put, i repose my faith in the anti profiteering committee uh, and also you have to repose your faith in the manufacturers because it's a business uh, dynamics uh, i mean uh, because of the competition you know people will have to pass on the benefit of uh, tax and that's how it has been happening but yes uh, otherwise you will have to get into the calculation of how will you know how the mrp has been fixed up as yeah, a consumer I, I you know. will not know so to m- okay certainly yeah. right yeah. but it it's easier to decipher in services right where i think uh, the component will be very clear in the in my bill yes uh, yeah but what about cost of services if the service providers have got certain benefits of gst hmm. then that also they are supposed to pass on right. so Supp- suppose your service bill 100 plus 15% gst uh, service tax if you are paying right. in gst 
that should be 100 plus 18 percent right. but that 100 is correct or not because that also should go down because of GST no I'm, I'm saying that. from the yeah. point of view of even deciphering from a simple bill that whether uh, the cost implication it's easier to do that with services because yes that component will be very clear to me in my bill I agree for products it's not that easy right. unless you have to check with the manufacturer no manufacturer is going to give you say, that but price. you have to uh, believe the businesses Okay, okay. alright. Uh, all repose my faith in the yes, anti profiteering yeah, committee. Yeah, Last yeah. question comes from Amit Agarwal Santosh and he says the registered dealer needs to pay GST through the reverse charge mechanism, mechanism on each purchase of goods and services from an unregistered dealer, whether uh, it is part of the final product or not. Part of the final product. So, so his question is that the registered dealer needs to pay GST through the re reverse charge mechanism on each purchase of goods and services from an unregistered dealer. Yes. Right. So if you are a registered person and you have purchases yes. from the unregistered people, then you have to make the payment of tax and you get the credit. So actually that does not increase the cost. Okay. okay. If, if you are eligible to claim the credit of that, which means it will add to the compliance requirement. Sure. Yes. So for, of course, if you are dealing in the product, in which uh, you know the you don't get credit or there are certain expenses mm. on which credit is not available then certainly that would be additional cost right okay. and that's in irrespective of whether i'm dealing with the unregistered or a registered dealer no if you are dealing with unregistered dealer then you will have to pay the tax on Correct. his behalf. If you are right. dealing with the registered dealer, certainly he will certainly charge in his invoice. Okay. All right, Santosh, thank yeah. you so much for thank joining you. us thank with you. your thoughts on input tax credit yeah. provisions and answering some of our viewer queries. And thank you so much for watching. Do keep writing uh, to us on our email, Twitter and Facebook uh, pages uh, with your questions on, on the various rules that are troubling you in the GST regime. Thank you so much for My watching. Pleasure. Thank you.